Hey, Didarati, members of Dida Mail Club, my fans, my followers, uh, my customers, my clients. So, welcome aboard. Um, so, what I'm trying to do, you know, we at Dida have decided amidst all this lockdown, you know, the doom and gloom, we'll just try to add some color uh, to your lives and our lives as well. So, and who better to talk about color than Louise Hong? So, I have Louise with me today, and Louise is a very interesting person. She is a designer. And she is working on a range of uh, colorful surf accessories, uh, which she handcrafts um, pretty much herself and her a small team. But what's more exciting is that Louise actually works very closely with Mexican artisans, a community of Mexican artisans. So I would stop talking and I would i uh, hand it over to Louise and Louise would tell you exactly what she is doing. So Louise, welcome aboard. Welcome uh, in Dida's chat room. And would you tell our, you know, members of Dida Rati, which is the Dida Mail Club, uh, who is Louise? And you've already got a heart, which is amazing. And who is Louise? And what is Louise about? And your uh, surf wear, surf accessories label, it's called Olama. job than than myself so i just hand it over to you thank you samita hi everyone um yes i'm this is my first facebook live so yeah this is all new to me <laughs> um i have worked in the fashion industry for about 12 years working corporate for some really big brands uh such as guest jeans i worked in italy and in um in hong kong and i've worked in canada i've worked in australia and after working the corporate world, I just decided that I, it was no longer what, what inspired me. So for the last uh, about five years pre-COVID, I have been traveling Latin America. I lived in Guatemala for about five, six months, and I've spent the last three years in Mexico uh, with the desire to learn more about Mexican artisans and textiles. Um, to which it really, really has inspired me. So the travels were based on surfing on the coast of Mexico and also getting into the interior of Mexico, into the mountainous regions and discovering all the different art forms that they have there. Um, Olimar was born while I was sitting on the beach, wondering why there weren't any surface, surf accessories made for surfers and beachgoers. So I just uh, was sitting with a bu bunch of people who were traveling and coming to Mexico for surfing. And I recognized that they were, they were all looking to take home something from Mexico, yet um, there wasn't really anything that was available to them uh, on a contemporary level, you know, designed products that they could use and where they could support artisans. And my passion was, uh, my passion is surfing and my passion is working with artisans and find a way to unify both these items and both these things and so I decided to con uh, to continue my path of researching artisans and I found myself living in a beautiful colorful town uh, called Oaxaca it is definitely my favorite state in Mexico and it is incredibly beautiful it's cobblestone streets colorful buildings old and colonial and basically all the surrounding towns dedicate themselves to working with uh, different artisanal products. It can be basket weaving, woolen carpet making, um, and also embroideries and working with cotton weaving. And because I decided that I was gonna work and develop surfboard bags, that was my first kind of like concept and, and product that I wanted to bring out to on a global market and I, uh, yeah, I started researching places that I could have fabrics woven up and I started, yeah, developing fabrics with artisans um, in Oaxaca in a town called Meatla. 
I work with a family of artisans. They make everything on a shuttle loom, uh, a shuttle loom, which is essentially a foot loom. Um, I work with the, the width of about 170 centimetres. Everything is made by hand. The machines take the equivalent of a month to set up. And just to do two metres of fabrics takes them about three hours. So it is a time-consuming process. And it is also, um, it's also a process which is slowly dying due to globalisation, you know, people developing things in, in China and all these products coming in from China. And so all these beautiful arts and crafts are just slowly fading away. And I really wanted to find a way to support and find a way to preserve this beautiful culture, which has totally inspired me. And that's how Olamar was born. Yep. Yep. Sounds very much very similar to my story. This is what I have been fighting against, Louise, you know, the, the fast production, mass production, um, commercialization and extinction. You know, eventually it leads to extinction of handcrafting and as you mentioned handcrafting when you look at them when you look at artisans trying to make something it's so laborious and that's when you realize that it's such a wonderful skill which you and i should you know and all of us should make an attempt to kind of preserve for the future generations and if we do not do that then um, there'll be nothing left but I'm so, uh, it's so interesting that, you know, you have combined surf accessories with uh, artisan crafts. So who says that we cannot do uh, things with, you know, these artisan crafts are limited. They are not. You just have to push boundaries. But also having been, I mean, I have been working with artisans all my life and I know that at times it's there are challenges. It's not easy. It's not something you can work out of a boardroom. And you and I, we have both have corporate experience, but we know that when you are working with artisans, it, it has to be something very organic, the relationship, you know. So I would, I'm pretty sure you have, but I would like to ask you, what are the challenges? At times, there's a lot of skepticism. It's very difficult to get them to work on your, I know you're already smiling, to work on your ideas and, you know, just inspire them to, you know, uh, deviate a little bit from what they are used to doing. So all of that, I'm pretty sure the story is quite familiar to you. I have told my story quite a few times but I'd like it to like that you speak up and you share your story with us what are the challenges that you faced when you were working with the Mexican artisans and how have you overcome the challenges or is it still an, an ongoing battle how how are you coping with all of that so I must um, uh, ask you to share your experience with my my audience Okay, so yes, it's definitely a challenge. It's not like working in the first world countries where we work via a calendar and we have yeah. deadlines. It just does not work like that. They come from an entirely different culture. Things happen when they happen. Um, and, and also because they come from a different culture where work is just, it just doesn't seem like just the means to an end like it's really important their, their livelihood and their lives and and the cultural things that surround what they do so for example if there's a death in the family or something like that you know they need to celebrate that and they might not be working for a couple of weeks while, while they're mourning and you know so you've all you always got these continual obstacles which you got to work around um i remember in particular when i first started I came across this town called Neatla and my goal was to just look for artisans and see if they could like develop a specific fabric for me and many of them turned me away because I think on a cultural level some people can be quite closed-minded and they weren't ready to explore and experience and try new things and um, the town of Meatla actually dedicates itself to a cotton weaving process and most of the items are curtains. Um, they make uh, bed spreads, bed linens, and like tablecloths and things like that. And I wanted to develop 
a fabric that was a lot thicker than what they had. So mm -hmm. I had to come towards them and, and just discuss my projects. And it took time. It actually took quite a few weeks to find uh, artisans that were willing to work with me on that level. So um, it's definitely a process of... Um, it's definitely a process of trial and error and I found that, you know, some artisans couldn't, uh, they weren't able to get the quality that I was after and so then you just got to move on and continually look for other people that were willing to take the chance on me basically. And I was lucky enough to find a family that were willing to take the chance and, um, and do samples for me and when it worked out, uh, you know, it just works out the way it does organically. And, and it is a slow process. It's not, it's not something that you can say, yeah, in a month I'm going to have this done. It just doesn't work like that. Um, so you've got to always continually go with the flow with what can happen, what you, what you can achieve. I'm sure, Samita, you've, that's happened to you before. Oh, many, many times. Yeah, many yeah. times. Uh, you cannot just have very rigid uh, timelines in place. And you have to be respectful. You know, you have to be mindful of the... Uh, cultural protocols and uh, the social norms so yes that's very important because and the social aspect is very strong so it's as I mentioned that we cannot um, we have to we have to abide by all of that and we have to work around and work with the cultural protocols and the social norms that's very important takes a long time as you mentioned you rightly you correctly mentioned louise it takes a long time to get accepted but i can assure you that once that acceptance happens you know once you are accepted into the community there's so much love and respect you know you they give back so much to you so more than what we give to them so whoever talks to me about us oh, samita are you doing charity are you doing no i am not because I am getting back as much from them as probably more as I am giving to them. So, yes, I understand that you ha you are going to, through a very similar experience, but um, uh, that's what it is, uh, working with the artisans. Um, now, uh, coming back to Earth, so uh, Louise, as a startup, and especially given the context, you know, a new business um, and you and I when we were talking last time you did mention that there are of you did highlight a few challenges so what what challenges are you facing given the current scenario and as a startup small business what do you think are the hurdles that you have to overcome and are you what are your what are your strategies um, uh, or would you like some help and help from like, you know, some support from the community or from um, organizations or what is it that you are facing and uh, what's your game plan? Okay, so um, basically I, I came back to Australia um, just when the just just before COVID hit, and uh, I was meant to go back. I was living in Mexico. I had my apartment in in Oaxaca. The idea was to start the business over there and make it work over there and do production over there. However, because of COVID, I was unable to go back, and I thought that staying in Australia was the safer bet for me. And so mm -hmm. during lockdown. Um, I had to come up with new ways of, of working the business, basically. My intention was not to develop and bring the products over here. It was to develop it over there and sell it from there. So I actually started a government-funded uh, program called NIS, N-E-I-S, uh, which mm -hmm. supports young entrepreneurs to, to do a startup business. So I did that in, in the middle of the, at the start of the pandemic, which helped really support me uh, to develop my business plan and ideas for my startup and definitely something I needed because, like I said, I've done corporate before, but I've never actually started my own business and, and those are real obstacles um, just starting by myself. Um, also, uh, with COVID, I had to figure out a way of shipping, bringing the fabrics over here and because I couldn't do production over there, I now have to do production here myself, which is a lot more costly than what I had factored in um, mm -hmm. at the beginning of my business plan. So these are the challenges that I'm facing that uh, 
due to developing the product in Australia and having the fabric shipped here, the product is a bit is on a higher end scale um, because you know we are supporting sustainability, we are supporting Absolutely. artisans, and uh, we're also supporting Australian made products. So Absolutely. these are the challenges that I'm facing, and currently uh, to work on those challenges, I'm also developing a collection. Um, that is smaller and that can also encompass uh, a, uh, a broader demographic of people that aren't just surfers. So I'm creating a smaller bag range for beachgoers, yeah. people that yeah. can take uh, bags to the beach. And these are just kind of like pivoting the business basically to make it work for me as a, a small business. Um, but learning how to do all the social media things, learning how to build a website, these have been real struggles for me. And I have just started to reach out to people like you, Samita, um, to just uh, support me and uh, give me ideas. You've, been, you've done this before. You've done this many, many times um, over and you have much more experience than I do. So um, as a young startup, I, I pre I've been basically reaching out to other people that have started their businesses on a similar platform. And that's how yep. I'm working these challenges. Yes, there are. The challenges have compounded, actually. You know, I have been in business for a very long time, but like logistics, shipping is an absolute nightmare now mm -hmm. uh, because of congestion, port congestion, because of social distancing. Um, then, you know, cash flow becomes a problem when your clients are not selling, you are not selling. So uh, we are all, I think, we are all afflicted by those kind of problems. And um yeah, we, you and I, we had a long chat and we did, uh, you know, uh, work out kind of a marketing plan. So, uh, the, so coming to marketing, you know, to, to be able to stay afloat, we all need, you know, cash flow. Liquidity is very important. So uh, I would want you to share your business model because there are people who are watching this some of them might be wholesale my some of my wholesale accounts um b2c customers you know retail customers uh, some people who might i mean we are all in love with Mex mexican textiles and some people might like to get something manufactured so louise please explain what is your business model are you open to um, wholesaling, like, you know, wholesaling to accounts? Are you open to custom manufacturing and also B2C? Suppose I, as a as an individual client, I want to buy some of your products or some of my friends would for sure after this, they would like to, you know, maybe some people because I live next to a beach and <laughs> there are lots of uh, very passionate surfers out here so they might want some surfing accessories so where do we find you and how do we shop for olamar so yeah if you can please explain so that might that might you know uh, bring you some business yes um you can find me at www.olamar.com.au that is my um website platform and on social mm -hmm. media on uh, on Instagram, you can find me as Olimar underscore surf. And you can find me on my Facebook page, which is also Olimar. Um, right now, I have, I'm not going wholesale. Uh, my product, because of the production costs, is quite high. And so I'm going to direct sales off social media. And also, um, after my chat with Samita, also something that I had considered were the summer markets. I live in the Northern Rivers. So mm -hmm. the idea of local uh, markets along the beach coast during the summer months is something that I'm definitely considering. Mm -hmm. And um, I am actually open. I'm a product developer. You know, I'm not mm -hmm. just a designer. I've been a product developer uh, for a good part of my career. And I mm -hmm. would actually love to support artisans in any way. And I would actually be open for people that wanted to develop products in Mexico. Um, that's yeah. something that I'm absolutely passionate about. It's something that I've thought about um, uh, like for a while. And it's, yeah, mm -hmm. it's something that I wanted to do while I was living in Mexico is, is liaise and, and develop products. Because for me, the preservation of these beautiful cultural techniques and traditions um, it doesn't matter if it's just my brand out there. What matters is that other people are supporting them and and that their product is going out there on a global market. 
Absolutely. It's critical, actually, you know, just for their survival, any any part of the world. I have worked with artisan communities all over the world. And this is what because, you know, the, the youngsters, the second generation, they, they have to kind of continue with the uh, tradition and skills of their forefathers. And they'll only do it when it generates income. So people like you and me, we have a social responsibility to give back to the communities and um, ensure their survival. So uh, Louise, I would actually, I'm I already, you know, the creative juices are starting to flow because I'm, I, I'm in love with Mexican textiles. Many of us, I'm sure, they love the Mexican, as you mentioned, the carpets, the, the, the colors, oh, the, the weeds, rugs, they're beautiful, yeah. and the rugs, they're beautiful. And um, so, some of us would be thinking along those lines and i know because i do not i think you are the only concrete contact i have in latin america because elsewhere africa asia uh, europe america i'm covered it's latin america that i'm, I'm lacking a little bit but it's uh, not so much i know mexico is in um, the north still in north america but the textiles are very similar uh to that you know the 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 latin american genre uh and you and i we are both big fans of frida Kahlo, aren't we so absolutely <laughs> so, <laughs> who, isn't? Um, who isn't exactly who isn't so um i think we've been talking for a while and all of those links louise your instagram your socials your website i'll put all of those links um on my facebook and when i i would be posting this video the recording on youtube so if anyone wants to watch it on youtube i will be posting those links there and if you have any message for louise and if you're not able to get through to her you can always send a message to dida or samita and i would ensure uh, that it reaches louise and you are able to get some fabulous Mex sorry mexican inspired um, surf accessories and maybe work with louise in future louise thank you so much i know you're just like any small business in australia you're trying to do so much yourself just by yourself we spoke about all of that too uh, the other day when we you and i were talking so i would let you go and enjoy the rest of your evening and um Didarati, i would probably louise and i would say goodbye to you and i'm sh pretty sure that you you are uh, you had a fascinating experience uh, listening to louise um so um, uh, jump on to olamar and uh, do some sh surf shopping there so I think we should say bye for now. And I again meet you next Sunday, uh, same time. And uh, in the meanwhile, have a wonderful Sunday afternoon. So this is Samita and Louise. Um, we are saying goodbye to you. Bye for now. Catch you next week. Bye. See you later. Bye. Bye. So it's been about a year since we started Learn with Samita leader's YouTube channel and in this one year we have grown exponentially and who do we have to thank for that you leaders likers followers subscribers so if you are liking our videos do not forget to give us a thumbs up share comment like and subscribe because your likes, your comments, your subscriptions motivate us to do better. And if you would like us to cover a particular topic, mention in comments below. And we would do our best to comply with your request. Till then, this is Samita signing off. Bye for now.